Hey everyone, Nick here, and I just did an AMA for scalers.so. This is Joe Davies' private productization community that teaches agency owners uh, how to scale their businesses. I thought I would record a video just going through answers to a lot of those questions because I know that these are things that all of you have been asking me about. So I'm gonna talk about things that I've never covered before on camera, including uh, some productivity systems for output, specifically on YouTube, and then with my own automation company. Uh, I talk about everything from like how I personally got started in business, my first few steps, to what I would do if I were uh, all of a sudden back at square one again and I had no customers, clients, or anything like that. I'll also talk about some very automation specific things as well as email systems, uh, what I do if I didn't know anything about CRMs, where to go to learn about email copywriting and all that sort of stuff. So if that sounds interesting to you, then stay tuned and let's get into it. Okay, so this is Scalers. It's Joe Davies' community. I love this wonderful man. Look at this ugly mug. He is uh, one of the most successful productized agency owners on planet Earth. Guy runs Fat Joe, which does, I think, well over $10 million a year. I may be mistaken on that. Don't hold me to it. Uh, but they're super, super successful in with really high margins. And so I've worked with Joe before, and I consider him a friend of mine, and I uh, thought we'd sort of collab by me doing an AMA. The way that we structured it was we put a post up for 24 hours just because our time zones do not sync up. Uh, tons of people posted on it and asked me a bunch of questions. And I'm going to both provide a textual response there and then I'm just gonna answer in the video, provide a lot more context and that sort of thing. So yeah, this is where we're at right now. Uh, I am getting a couple of messages here. So if, uh, I don't know, you hear weird noises or whatever, I just turn down my volume, hopefully that'll fix it. Uh, but just, uh, just be aware of that. So I'm just gonna start at the top at what I consider the most important question and then work my way down. The way that I've set this up is I'm now using ClickUp to manage all of my uh, videos and I've sort of produced a content calendar. So we're getting very systematic here. And uh, I've, I've actually written down the question and the answer to the question below. So the first and probably the most important question in my humble opinion that a lot of people are probably wondering is, hey Nick, you seem to have a relatively high output. What's your system for getting things done? And I hope I say that humbly, um, but I did not used to get probably like a 10th of what I get done now until I learned what I'd consider to be the single most important thing that any young entrepreneur or business owner can learn. And that's the difference between effectiveness and efficiency. So when I first started in business, the most important thing to me was to do the task that I was working on as quickly and as effortlessly as possible. I just cared about, okay, I got a task in my queue. I'm just gonna figure out the simplest and easiest and quickest way to get it done. And that was great in terms of my ability to get a certain number of tasks done but I found that I was never really moving the lever. I was never really moving the various aspects of my life forward that I wanted to move forward. So, um, you know, my career, my revenue, my business, my relationships, all those things were sort of stagnating. I was really good at them for sure, uh, but they were never actually really moving forward in any meaningful way. And the reason why is because though I was being efficient, I was not being effective. If efficiency is your ability to do one task really well and very quickly, then effectiveness is you taking a couple steps back and asking yourself, hey, which tasks should I be working on anyway? Which ones are providing me the, the ROI in my life that I want? Do I even need to do this task? Hell, I might be really good and really fast at doing this task. I might be super efficient, but is that even necessary to start with? A lot of the time you'll find that those tasks are not necessary. The ones that you're the most efficient at are usually ones that you just should not be doing in the first place. And so it's actually the tasks that you're, you're usually very inefficient at uh, that usually move the leader and, uh, lever and most people ignore them in favor of tasks that are easy and, and that they feel good doing. So effectiveness over efficiency, really good paradigm shift, especially if you guys are early on in business. Um, just take a couple steps back and ask yourself what you find valuable, what you find meaningful, and what you think will really produce like an outsized ROI in your life. Um, and that's, you know, personally, the, the number one most important thing in my life for getting things done. Another system that I use, and I've written about this a little bit on my blog recently, is uh, minimization of friction. It's sort of a paradigm, and I'm not like inventing this. This has definitely been written and talked about before but I'm using it now and it seems to be providing a, a very disproportionate ROI to the time I spend. Basically, instead of me focusing on working really hard, I focus on lifestyle design and ways to uh, build systems in my life that make it just easy to do things that produce money or impact or relationship value or, or anything like uh, of the sort. And so a quick example of that is, uh, for instance, the reason my YouTube output so high, a lot of people are asking me, hey man, how are you recording a video every day? The reason why I'm able to record a video every day is because it's not actually that much extra work. The stuff that I record is basically 99% of the time just shit that I'd be doing anyway. And it's more just documentation. And then there's a little, maybe 10% or 20% added time just in terms of my explanations and be slowing things down to make sure that they're understandable and that sort of thing. But the overhead is nowhere near as much as I think most people are considering. Like the way that I built out the systems to record the YouTube videos, if you've watched my previous video on how I grew to 
like 4K subs or something in, uh, in less than 25 days, I believe. Um, you know, my recording setup is super simple. All I do is I just click a button and then I start talking. Don't really have to worry about editing or crazy lighting hijinks or anything like that. It's just like a one click on sort of deal. I don't worry too much about um, the way that I SEO optimize. Like I, I don't worry about any of that stuff because to me, the highest lever task, if we're thinking from an effectiveness perspective, not an efficiency perspective, the highest lever that I can pull or the biggest lever that I can pull is uh, just producing the content in the first place. And so the way that I see it is I want to run really far. I don't really want, want to run super fast. Again, effectiveness over efficiency. Um, so I just build like my lifestyle in such a way that it's easy to do things like produce content without me necessarily um, spending a lot of my own time, energy, or effort on it. And that's actually the reason why I started uh, writing recently because I actually do write every day. I, I journal usually most days. Uh, well, maybe not as, re not as much as I would like recently, but I journal most days. And what I've decided to do is just post that journal online. Uh, because if I'm doing work anyway on documenting my thoughts, and if my thoughts, if I personally think that my thoughts are valuable enough that other people would probably find value in them, uh, I might as well just post them online, kill two birds with one stone, and then just get a bunch of content out, right? So yeah, um, I have a lot of rationale here on my blog. And if you guys are interested, I'm considering just making this a newsletter again and actually like posting stuff out in email. But uh, that's that's my thought process there. Additionally, um, I'm minimizing friction with regards to content consumption. So whether you know we're talking Instagram or YouTube or Netflix or TikTok, I think it's unrealistic nowadays, considering that the content landscape we all live in is so weaponized. It's unrealistic nowadays to not really consume content. You can try, and you can try and live as like a monastic order monk or something, shave your head and wear cool fancy robes, and then not watch YouTube ever. But it doesn't really seem very reasonable to me, given how it's basically our outlet into like world culture and it's very productive potentially, like it's just engaging and it's fun. So what I've done instead is I've focused on consciously designing the content that I consume to just be as high value as possible. I follow a bunch of what I would consider really high ROI creators. And the way that I see the shift in, I guess, socializing is now we're a lot more parasocial and a large portion of the way that we socialize is just through social media and stuff like that. So um, instead of the old adage where it's like you are the five, the average of the five people you spend time with, it's now more like you are the average of the 50 YouTube creators or whatever that you subscribe to. So you have total control over the top of that funnel off of changing those YouTube subscribers. And if you can consciously design them to be people that you're interested in and you look up to and that are your role models, your life will be a lot better. So yeah, both of these are, are minimization of friction, conscious lifestyle design sort of things. And then the last is uh, zooming out. And this is gonna sound pretty like hippy dippy and maybe not everybody's gonna agree with me, but uh, the way that I see it is realistically, unless we nuclear vaporize ourselves sometime in the next like 10 or 15 years, the entire internet, the SSDs, the servers, everything like that, it's going to be around for like the next million years, assuming that you know humanity lives that long. People could be listening to or getting value from the stuff that you're producing right now in the year 2400. And so I think most people consider the work that they do like a temporary, transient, and fleeting thing. But I think about the work that I do as something that will potentially be, it's like a statue that I'm building for hundreds or thousands of years. And there are some moments when I feel pretty demotivated and I'm sort of in a slump. But when I think back to that, sort of all the bullshit just gets stripped away. And I'm like, wait a second, the YouTube comment I'm leaving or this video that I'm recording or the AMA that I'm doing or whatever. Sure, it may be a lot of time and energy right now. It might be taking a little bit more out of your day than you anticipated, but this is something that people will probably be watching for hundreds of years, realistically. So frame the expected value of that action in that light. And so, yeah, that's my zooming out advice. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, I believe it was actually Joe that asked me that question directly, which is quite nice. The next question is, Nick, if you were to start again from scratch, would you start your content agency or would you start LeftClick, uh, the process optimization company? This is a good question. I think the reason why I started my content agency initially uh, was just because I had a very unfair advantage. If you think about onesecondcopy.com, you know, it's a content writing business. And a lot of people now think that content is just doable with AI and that sort of thing. Well, if you roll back the clock like three years, uh, nobody knew about AI. And there was very little public awareness that AI could do any of this stuff. The only real people that knew about AI were, was me and, you know, the company that I was running. And so I trained all of our writers to use artificial intelligence, which allowed us to produce probably three or four times as much for the same amount of money. Uh, we managed to uh, minimize turnaround time significantly lower than most other companies could. This was a massive freaking advantage, but it was only a massive 
advantage to us at the time, right? If you were to start a content company again today, well, you wouldn't really have those advantages because now the, leveling, the, the playing field is all level. So in short, I would not start a content agency today. I would absolutely start an automation agency though. And that's basically what I, what I did. Granted, I'm sort of doing a freelance outfit. You know, I work with people from time to time, but it's mostly freelance. But the way that I see it is right now, everyone knows about ChatGPT. Everyone's following Twitter or the news on AI because it's so relevant to their lives. But nobody really knows how to implement that into your business. And so awareness of automation is really high. Demand for automation is really high. But we're still at the early stages of supply. And the best and most consistent way to get rich during a gold rush is not selling the gold or, or panning for gold. It's selling the shovels so that people can go out and pan for gold themselves. And that's basically the situation that we have here. I'm selling shovels, I'm selling automation services during the beginning of one of the biggest gold rushes of all time. So that's that. Another great question that I received was, hey Nick, how did you get started? What was your first few steps in business like? I have written at length about that uh, over here in this link, which I'll include in the description. It's basically just a biography about my life and where I'm coming from and sort of my family history and, and that sort of deal. But just to give you guys the real summarized version, the TLDR is my family went bankrupt when I was very young. They were immigrants from Eastern Europe and that really like changed my relationship and how I value money. As I was about to graduate, uh, I was initially on like a medicine path because you know those immigrant parents and the hustle lifestyle, <laughs> you gotta be a doctor. Uh, but as I was about to graduate, I sort of did the math and I was like, hey, actually, um, I could probably just start making money today. And if I'm good at what I do, I could probably make way more money today than I'd be able to make in like 10 years after I finish my doctor studies. Uh, I'd probably have less debt. I'd probably enjoy my life more. I just sort of did some ROI and it, medicine just didn't really seem that worth it to me. Another point here that I'm going to make that like 99% of people are probably going to disagree with me on is that I considered working like a nine to five or like a corporate style job, whether it's medicine, lawyer or something else is really insecure, is lacking in job security. And I do fundamentally believe this. Uh, I know people think that running companies and starting businesses and being an entrepreneur is super risky, and that's way riskier than a stable nine to five, but I see it in the exact opposite way. If you have 100% of all of your income coming from one source, if that source gets wiped out tomorrow, you're done, you're back to zero. You have no security, no stability, and really no life to speak of. Instead, if you run a business and you have 100% of your income split between 20 sources, that's 5% each. If any one of those go out of business, well, now you're at 95% of your income, not 100%. Even in a catastrophic uh, economic event or maybe AI coming and replacing large portions of your industry, you're probably at least still fine to some degree. And so I firmly believe that. And that was one of the reasons uh, that, and you know, my, my poor kind of scarcity relationship with money, that was one of the reasons why I decided that I would start a business. So the way that that worked in practice is immediately after I graduated and uh, I decided that I was not going to go into medicine, I started selling marketing services door to door with one of my uh, best friends and one of my business partners at the time, his name was Gurinder. And this guy was just whimsical. He was, he was a magical salesman. I've never seen anything like it. He would go out in a dingy suit and convince a random business owner of like a $10 million a year business to like book a meeting with him to sell them $100 a month Google ad services or something. So unbelievably unnecessary, but they, they bought it up and they ate it up because of his charisma and because of his charm. And to me, it was just the most magical thing ever. So. I started going out with him and uh, we started dating. No, I started going out with him door to door and we ended up wrapping an agency around it that was like a marketing service at the time called Pacific Creative Group. And we ended up scaling that to like 150K in a year or something. But because it was one of the first real businesses I'd ever run, it was disproportionately valuable. Uh, we did end up splitting up. We just had some partner difficulties and differences. But after that, I started an event video, uh, videography business, which ended up scaling to about 10K a month. And then uh, that's when COVID-19 hit. And then if you're in the event business and doing videography around an event business, you're not gonna have a good time during COVID-19. So uh, yeah, our business is basically mandated illegal by the government, which is pretty unfortunate. But from there, I managed to get put on a path of like programming, uh, which sort of happens if you're just like forced to stay at home for you know 24 hours a day for several weeks, your mind starts wondering, hmm, like I wonder if this computer shit makes any sense. And then uh, I started binging a YouTube channel called Traversy Media, which is basically just like the best programming channel ever. It taught me everything that I know about like web development and some simple stuff in hindsight, but just the way that it was explained was really good. I actually leverage a lot of what I learned from him in terms of how to talk to people, how to explain people, um, explain things to people in this channel. So if you're interested in productivity and if you're interested in uh, web dev, uh, and if you like me, then maybe check Traversy Media out too. Um, hopefully this is at least a, a the smallest thank you that I could give him. 
anyway, eventually I started freelancing. And then from freelancing, I learned a lot more about AI. And then I fell down a massive rabbit hole of text generation. GPT-2 was just coming out at the time, or it was just gaining popularity at the time uh, for misinformation and all that stuff. And it was just starting to come to the fore about how these technologies might actually be pretty devastating politically. And then I was just like so hooked. I was like, man, you can like write stuff with this? This is insane. So my interests at the time were freelancing and then text generation. And so I think you can see how the intersection of both was me starting to do freelance writing instead of freelance development, uh, just using these text generation tools. And then that quickly took off and I ended up wrapping an agency around that. That ended up being my content agency, One Second Copy, um, which you know we, we were able to scale pretty quickly. So yeah, that's that. Another question I received is, Nick, if you had to start over today, what niche or industry would you pick and how would you get your first couple of clients? This is a fantastic question. I sort of answered it before, so I'm not gonna beat that to death, but I would definitely do automation. Uh, selling shovels during a gold rush, man. Everybody wants A in their business. Nobody knows how to do it except for me. My roadmap to the first client, uh, I've talked about this before in a video, but essentially I would start by joining an agency community. So I would Google like agency communities. Well, maybe not that. Maybe I'd do like marketing agency community. And then I just find like a big list of marketing communities. Uh, and then I, you know, join as many of the free ones as you can. I go on Facebook and join those too. I join communities like scalers.so, right, which I think is currently free. Um, and I just, you know, get as involved in as many agency communities as possible, because presumably those are the people I'm going to be selling automation services to. And then I just post very consistently every day uh, or two for maybe a week or two, and I just provide as much value as I can solving specific problems. If you don't know what the problems that agency owners suffer from are, then just read... Um, just watch my channel, watch a couple of other channels on the subject, and I'm sure you'll know enough to at least impress somebody. Some percentage of those people that uh, respond to you will be down for a call. So after you DM them and are like, hey, I'd love to chat about this with you a little bit more in detail, some percent of those people say yes. And then uh, when you are on the call, show them what they need to do in order to achieve the thing that they want to achieve. And some percent of those people will say, hey, I want to work with you. And then of the people that say that, hey, I want to work with you, um, send them a proposal, send them a, a list of prices that you offer, that sort of thing. And some percent of those people say yes to that. So it's really just like a volume in, volume out thing. Um, if I already get my first customer, I could probably do it within a few days realistically, but I think maybe a week or two is more, more feasible for most people that don't have business, um, uh, like an understanding of how to do business communication, that sort of thing. Anywho, hope that helps and I really appreciate it. Another question is, Nick, your output is phenomenal, huh? You're gonna make me cry. How many hours a week do you work? I actually have a time tracker that can answer this question exactly. It's called Rise. Uh, Rise basically just does all of my time tracking for me. It's super crazy invasive and it watches where my mouse goes, the various URLs that I'm on and that sort of thing. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. You give it all the permissions that it needs in order to do it and then you kind of kind of take it from there. Um, but he asked me how many hours a week do I work? So yeah, it looks like I didn't track on Tuesday, which is weird. So maybe I just didn't, uh, I don't think I turned it on. Uh, but anyway, I'm just going to take the average. So average time work per day seems to be about 7 hours and 55 minutes right now. Um, that's different from what I wrote. I wonder why that difference is... Uh... Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it's because I counted Tuesday before and I'm not counting Tuesday. I don't know. But anywho, um, on average, if we just multiply 7 hours and 55 minutes... Uh, what's 7 55 minutes? I don't know, it's like 7.875 or something. And we multiply that by six, which is usually how many uh, days a week I work, then that's 47.25 hours. Uh, this is a little bit higher than usual, just because I'm also now responding to YouTube comments and doing a couple things that I previously did not. So realistically, if I could be honest, it's probably somewhere around 35 to 40 hours, just like most people that are watching this video. Nothing special. Uh, I believe that I am just capable of providing slightly more output because I focus on effectiveness over efficiency uh, and, and lifestyle design, so. Yeah, that's that. Another great question is, Nick, what is your 10-year plan? I want to become the most respected person in this industry. I don't necessarily want to become the most popular, and I feel like the two are often conflated, just like effectiveness and efficiency. My goal is for people to like what I have to say, to dig my authenticity, and to get a lot of value out of what I'm telling them, and hopefully go out and change their lives. I'll be honest, I don't really have any more concrete milestones than that at the moment. Plus, with the YouTube channel growing faster than I thought, my trajectory and how long I thought it would take to do the various things I want to do in my life have changed significantly. So I'm not going to lay it out much more granularly than this, but uh, if I could just give you the roadmap, it would become number one, be incredibly well respected. Number two, join or start some company where 
this company has a significant impact on our vertical. And then number three would be to achieve some type of legacy or security or, or uh, safety for my family or, or that sort of thing. So I'd say those are, that, that's the rough bird's eye view if you were to zoom way out. If I could crystallize it further and figure out where I want to take that, I would. But I found that this is one of those weird problems in life where the time that you spend trying to solve it is completely divorced from how effective you are at solving it. I've like lied in my bed for 10 hours a day and just thought like, what the hell do I want? And it doesn't really seem like that actually gets me any closer to figuring out what I want. So I've elected just to start moving and then hopefully I'll figure that out as I go along. So yeah, I believe that is as realistic an answer that I can give you. Okay, now we're starting to get into more agency specific questions. And the first one here is, Nick, do you see potential in doing a productized automation service approach? And if so, how would you go out and do it? My answer to that is absolutely freaking yes. Uh, I've actually tried it before. It's worked reasonably well, and I do plan on doing it again at some point moving forward. If you guys have heard of Design Joy or Revolution Design, I think. Revolution.design, probably. I think that's it. I might be completely mistaken here. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you look at these two businesses, these are basically what are called design subscription businesses, and they're just productized ways um, or subscription-based ways to grow agencies disproportionately quickly compared to what most people think is possible. Uh, and so this is actually one of my uh, friends from Twitter. Uh, love, love him to death, man. This is such an such a incredible designer. Uh, but probably the more well-known one is, is Bread at Design Joy. And the way that these companies work is you just pay like a flat service uh, every month, and then you get like unlimited numbers of requests. And very, very profitable. It's been written about a lot recently, and it's just like taking off as we speak as a business model. That said... I'm definitely not doing it right now. To be successful with a productized type of service, you need to be against any sort of consulting or any sort of business model that pays you directly for your time. At the moment, I'm doing a ton of consulting because I find it extremely interesting and I love getting into bed with companies and learning about how they operate, especially in the various industries that I'm in. It's just the most interesting thing that I've ever done. I'm also attempting to pitch these people on much larger relationships. So they usually start pretty small with me, three, four K a month. And then I will, after working with them for a certain amount of time, understand their business, see their growth potential, and figure, hey, I could probably help them reach 10 times that in X amount of time, um, where I'll then propose like a percentage revenue share or some type of equity. And I find that that is really valuable as well. Um, I'm, in, I'm interested in finding like a prize winning racehorse and then helping train that racehorse to go even faster than it's going. So yeah, that, that's sort of what I'm doing, but don't just pay attention to what I'm doing. Maybe I'm not the best example here. If you want a better example of what productization might look like, check out Fat Joe, because Joe really has nailed productization. Now, if I were to give you a roadmap, because I believe strongly that any questions should have a seven point list as an answer, uh, here's exactly what I would do. Let's say you're selling automation systems. I would ask myself to start, hey man, what systems do you have in make that are modular, easily repackageable, and provide an outsized impact? So if you've watched all my videos up until now, it'll probably be like the lead gen system that I've created, the helper reporter out system that I've created, these one-click CRM templates. Maybe I take one of those builds, save it as a template, make it a one-click thing, or maybe some of the email systems that I've made. I would find the systems that I would consider modular and repackageable, and then I would just like make a list. And these are now your e-commerce Shopify products. You know, these are your these are your your products that you can work with. When you have them, I would then make a list of every platform that you need to integrate to make that system work. So we're using make.com here. Obviously make.com is the glue that holds systems together. So what the hell are the systems, right? Is it uh, Gmail and then Typeform? Is it Pandadoc and then ClickUp, right? Just make a list of all these. Once you have a list of these, you'll have a list of platforms and you'll have a list of, uh, sorry, you'll have a list of systems and then you'll have a list of platforms per each system. And they have everything that you need to actually go out there and then sell this. All you need to do is you need to set up a product on one of these like information product uh, services. So like Gumroad is a really good example. There's like another 10 that just aren't coming to mind right now, but basically they let you set up these payment products where people click and then maybe a webhook gets fired and then you catch the webhook and deliver a product. So maybe in practice, this is on Gumroad. And what you do is on Gumroad or on wherever you're selling your service, you actually ask the client, hey, in order for this to work, we need to integrate the platforms for you, obviously. So what's your email address and password to all of these platforms? Some people probably aren't gonna feel super comfortable with it or whatever. You can get around that comfort using password management platforms and maybe being a little bit more creative than I am now, but I think even this is going to work if they like and respect you enough. So uh, that's probably what I do to start. 
And then all you do is you build a flow that every time you get a new purchase, you will export your scenario template as maybe a blueprint or something. And then you'll pay a virtual assistant, somebody that's trusted and obviously can be can be promised or that can promise you that they're not going to do anything with these credentials that maybe would be considered malicious to make sure they got data, good data security practices and, and that sort of thing. And then all I would do is, is every time that happens, add a new task to a project manager. Your virtual assistant takes that task, goes in, implements the system, and then the costs for you would be incredible. Or sorry, the margins for you would be incredible. If you sell one of these systems for maybe 1K, the implementation time for your virtual assistant is probably going to take like 25 bucks. You, know, you pay somebody like 10-ish hour, dollars an hour. All they're doing is clicking through a bunch of authentication modals, maybe it takes them an hour or two generously. Uh, you're, pet, you're spending 25 bucks there. Then maybe you offer a standard two weeks of email support and you have another assistant or some, some executive that manages this for you. Uh, maybe that's like $75 in pay for like the 10 minutes they're solving this problem, five minutes they're dealing with this question, that sort of deal. On a thousand dollar system, then your uh, your margins are like ninety percent, and you're not really going to find better than ninety percent margins in basically any industry. So, I'd heavily consider uh, looking into that sort of thing. Now, this is sort of tempered by the fact that these platforms like Gumroad are now offering or taking a much larger cut, just because they realize their value. But still, uh, whether it's eighty-five percent margin, ninety percent margin, still a pretty damn successful business. Am I right? Next question is, what is the smartest and most impressive automation you have ever done? And this is a great question because it allows me to clearly identify a difference in what some people consider useful, other people consider impressive. I think that the two are very different. I think a smart system versus like an economically useful system, completely different things. My economically useful systems, the ones that generate me the most money, are usually like five modules in a row. My most impressive or intelligent systems are usually like super crazy complicated and they make me three dollars <laughs> so definitely want you guys to know that the systems that make money are usually very simple but i'll just run you guys through a couple of them right now from a sheer complexity perspective it would probably be my redditology automation basically what i did was and i did this with a business partner who did a ton of the editing side of things so i can't take all the work but if you type Redditology right now, you will find a bunch of pretty creepy ass videos. And I don't really want to turn the volume up because I think it's going to kind of screw with the um, recording that I have set up. But basically what we have here is we have a system that would go on Reddit and then scrape Reddit for top performing posts on various subreddits, usually ask Reddit, AMA, that sort of thing. It would then calculate the ratio of the uh, upvote to the, to the downvote. And then if it was above some threshold, maybe like a five or a six X or something, I, I don't know what we ended up using. And if it was above some absolute magnitude of popularity, then we would scrape every comment on that post. We'd organize those based off popularity, organize them into threads, and then we would feed every comment to an artificial intelligence voice, which at the time I think was either 11 Labs or Play.ht, one of the two big ones. I think 11 Labs has now sort of come out as, as, as the number one. And if we were to do it today, I mean, these voices sound like real humans, right? Sound just like me talking to you. Um, maybe I'm a maybe I'm a robot. Uh, anyway, so then we would uh, feed some of that information to uh, Dolly, I think, or maybe it was Stable Diffusion, and then we would generate images, and then that would be our thumbnail, and then we would feed that into like the most complicated video editing API, and then the end result, which I'm not actually going to show right now because I just tried doing it, and then I recorded about five minutes, and then I realized I had a voice talking in the background, which is really silly and stupid, and I need to fix that. Uh, but the end result was basically just like a, a voiceover that would be like r slash ask reddit what would you think is the most important blah 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 and then every time a comment was posted we'd change the picture to the comment and then the comment would be like oh it's on blah 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 or whatever the point i'm making is it was like a dialogue like a back and forth it was entirely ai generated which is pretty cool so yeah that was the most like technically impressive probably and i can't take credit for the um, editing portion of that because my uh, my business partner at the time was just really brilliant. He was working with a specific API and knew how to do it a lot better than I did. But that was super cool, and you can check that channel out below if you are interested. The most economically useful, which is probably what you and myself are significantly more interested in, was the proposal generator. Uh, basically, the way that it works is I will go and I will fill out a short two-minute proposal, and the proposal, um, uh, the proposal. Sorry, I'll go and I'll fill out a two minute uh, type form. And then on the type form, it'll ask a couple of quick questions just about who the client is, what they want, that sort of thing. And then assuming that, you know, I fill that out correctly and everything like that, before the end of the call, I will usually like click enter and then have a beautiful, customized, high quality proposal sent to the client. 
people love this so much and their responses vary from like, dude, this is crazy. You're just copying and pasting something from somebody else. There's no way you guys just made this. That's nuts. To how much money do you want and like what account should I send it to? So obviously very high ROI, very valuable. And this is just like five or six modules in a row in a straight line. Nothing fancy. Anybody can do this with any level of skill. What was really interesting about this, just while I'm on the topic, is that a lot of people wanted this exact same system for themselves. Uh, and that led to a bunch of funny situations where I was then using a system to sell them on the exact same system. And then some people loved it so much they offered to resell that system for me and then give me a cut. So they were selling, I sold them a system using a system which they would then sell that system to other people using that system. Super meta, uh, but yeah, definitely the most economically useful. I've made a fair amount of money on that. Okay, Nick, if you were at the beginning of your journey into automation for business, where would you start? Do you think somebody that has zero knowledge about how CRMs work has a chance in this game? And I'm really glad you asked me that because absolutely. Um, I've answered this question here before initially, so I'm just gonna skip to the second part. But yeah, man, if you have zero knowledge in CRMs, it's not a big deal at all. Like the distance between having zero knowledge in CRMs and then being able to charge money for CRMs is like two weeks, realistically. It's not a big deal. If you know how a Google Sheet works, you're probably about 50% of the way there already. All a CRM is, it's like a very dressed up pretty Google Sheet with some extra functionality for people that are less technically inclined usually. So wouldn't worry about that at all. Um, it just sounds like more of a self-esteem thing um, about your knowledge in the industry than, than anything else. The great part about 2024, man, is just you can learn anything you need in like two weeks and then be able to charge money for it. Unless you're doing like, I don't know, pipeline design, like actual oil pipeline design. <laughs> uh, anyway, what I would do if I were in your shoes is I would recommend picking one platform to start. And what I would do is I would pick ClickUp so ClickUp is not sponsoring this video, but they better damn sponsor it after, after this. Um, and what I do is I'd go to their help page and I'd read all the documentation, all the guides and, and all that sort of stuff. And then what I do is I go to this uh, wonderful woman called Layla at Process Driven, who I'm kind of scared to click this button because I think the audio is going to play. Whatever, I'm doing it anyway. Don't talk, Does Layla. Ah, she talked. Anyway, Layla is uh, really, really good at building out ClickUp-based processes. And she takes all of the templates and stuff that's inside of ClickUp natively and she just like adds so much context to them, just makes them so much higher quality. So I'd go in there, I'd hit her up. She's basically just like a worse version of me, honestly. <laughs> no, kidding. Uh, I'd go in there, I'd voraciously consume everything she's ever posted. I'm sorry, Layla. Uh, and then obviously go to my channel as well when you're done consuming the process driven queen. And then uh, at the end of that process, I guarantee you, you'll know more about ClickUp than 99% of people that are making money off it today. So you'll be in a good spot for sure. Okay, Nick, want to have your insights. What type of cold emails work well? Are there any templates available to get started with this? I really like the emails used in your video tutorial. So I am going to repeat a lot, what I, a lot of what I mentioned in the video tutorial, but essentially you can use any formula you want for this, like the IDA formula or I think the OEO formula. I don't know. There are a bunch of formulas for this stuff. This is what works for me. You always mention where you found them. So, hey man, I found you on Apollo or hey man, I was just like looking at Google Maps images for pictures of my ex-boyfriend and you know your business front came up or something uh, and I wanted to reach out. Number two is mention what you do for people like them. So specifically say, I build XYZ process for people like your business essentially, or you know, I generate leads for companies like X, Y, and Z. Then mention why they should care. So say something really big dick, if I could be frank, and be like, hey, you know, in 2024, I made X dollars for this company, and I'm confident I can do the same for you. And at the end, just do some type of call to action. Was that all worth a call? Do you get, do you guys find this interesting enough to sit down with me tomorrow at 8 a.m. for 34 minutes? You know, so, something like that. So I would just do variations of that. For templates, I don't have templates available. I would just, yeah, I would just copy and paste whatever I wrote initially in my previous video, and that's probably more than enough to at least get you guys started. I will give you some tone of voice tone of voice advice that I have not talked about up until now. Um, I went back after recording that last video on emails, which I think was like a week or two ago, and I looked at my highest performing campaigns, and then I looked at a couple of other accounts that I'm a part of where people have much higher performing campaigns, and I found that there's a big similarity between all of them, and that's the tone of voice that's used. High quality, higher ROI emails use a very specific tone of voice, and I kind of want to call it like the CEO tone. And that's where you're like a really busy CEO that just doesn't have time for bullshit. It's sort of like a yes or a no. Is this worth your time or is it not? And probably the clearest example I can give you of that is just, let's say you get an email and says, I would like to see if I can help you with XYZ process. If you just trim away everything except for literally the information that is relevant to like the, the sentence, and it doesn't even have to be grammatically correct anymore or missing a subject. I would like to see if I can help you with XYZ process. Want to help with XYZ. 
I mean, like that is just what, like a third of the length. It uses like a third of the words and it delivers the exact same message. Um, so yeah, that tone of voice seems to work extremely powerfully for me and for a lot of other people. And the way that I conceptualize it is sort of like a formula, like impact is equal to the number of words divided by the, no, the impact of each word is divided by the number of words to get like the total impact basically. So if you want to maximize the impact, you need to minimize the number of words. Okay, great. Nick, in these cold emails, do you recommend adding an unsubscribe URL to the bottom of the email? Does using an unsubscribe link affect the deliverability of the emails? Absolutely, it affects the deliverability of the emails and not in the way that you'd expect. I would not recommend ever adding an unsubscribe link to your email unless you are considered a bulk sender by Gmail or Outlook or these other platforms. I think a bulk sender is like a thousand or more emails a day coming from one workspace account. Um, I don't know for sure. A lot of people pretend like they know a lot about this and they don't because Gmail and Outlook and all of the various like sending infrastructure throughout the internet, you know, they're only ever going to tell you what they want you to think in order to make their lives easier, right? So they're going to tell you that you have, they have like bulk limits. They can automatically detect when you're sending. And, you know, if you send more than a 500 a day, then you need blah, blah, blah. But nobody really knows. And anybody trying to tell you that they know just doesn't. I mean, even I, I don't know. At least I'm admitting that I don't know. Uh, but a good rule of thumb for me is I don't send more than 1K outbound emails a day per uh, workspace um, without adding some type of unsubscribe link. And in practice, I've never done that. I've never hit more than 1K outbound emails from a Google Workspace account. So it's just never really been a problem. Maybe I could scale even higher. I don't know. But uh, I'm part of a bunch of communities where people do do this. And yeah, they say that that's generally like a good rule of thumb. So the reason why is because if you had an unsubscribe, like it's just going to like crush your, crush your results. Like nobody wants to deal. Well, very few people want to deal with robots. They much prefer to deal with people. And the success of a high ticket email campaign basically hinges entirely on your ability to convince them that you're a real person. Uh, in my opinion. Again, there are multiple ways you could do this. Some people do do very clearly robotic campaigns, but they like do funny stuff and they make it very meta and they have like gifts and shit and that works well for them. But it doesn't work well for me because I'm selling like high ticket stuff, right? So yeah, that's that. Nick, how would you structure an email marketing agency? That's such an interesting question. How would you structure an email marketing agency, including the client management, the strategy, the implementation, the copywriting, and the design through different stages? The stages that this lovely gentleman provided were uh, five members, 10 members, 20 members. I'm more than happy to help. I love stuff like this, such a thought experiment. I'm not gonna answer uh, what I do at different levels, five, 10, 20, just cause I don't really think that that makes that big of a difference and my advice isn't gonna change. But I will say before I get into this uh, disclaimer, I haven't run an email marketing agency on my own. So I want you to take it with a grain of salt. I have worked with a few and this is exactly what I would try if I were uh, starting an email marketing agency tomorrow. And I actually went out and I built out the ClickUp flow. So what I'd start with here is I would first set up all of my project management and click up, obviously. And by doing this, you're gonna have 90% of your work done in your whole company, for real. I'd set up a space. The space would first be called project management. It would look just like this, high level space. You click this button and then write project management below. And then every time I get a new client, I would add a new folder and I'd call it whatever the client name is. Within the folder, I would have three lists. One would be called strategy. Another would be called deliverables. And the last would be called resources. Strategy is where, when you're running an email marketing agency, you usually have some type of recurring event. So um, you'll have like a weekly call with the client to confirm and ask how things went last week to cover some campaign statistics, that sort of thing. You usually have this. Um, you can of course get by with like a weekly summary email or whatever, but basically the reason why agencies love these weekly calls is because it gives them an opportunity to show the client that you are basically like doing a really good job and that you deserve more money. And then you can upsell them really easily while building a relationship. So that's not what I wanted to do. So, uh, you know, on your weekly call, what you do is you, you have a, a, strat a strategist. So you hire a strategist and the strategist is probably in-house and they're probably salaried. And the expectation is, hey, if you're a strategist in my company, you can handle 10 clients at a time, something like that. But anyway, what happens is once a week they have that call and then the strategist goes through and then adds whatever stri strategic, strategic information, I'm Canadian, whatever strategic information that they need in order to make this work. So maybe they're like taking notes here or something like that. They have like a weekly note file. I don't know, you, you could do that. You could have like a weekly note file, I guess. Um, so maybe it'd be like uh, Mar 7 to Mar 14th, 2024. And then, you know, maybe every week when you have that call, uh, you jump in here and then you add notes about the call, right? Next, what you do is at the end of that call, the strategist's job is to go into the deliverables list and then create a bunch of deliverables to be assigned to contractors. 
So you have a conversation with the client about X, Y, and Z. The client's like, mm, you know, I want this, I want this. And you're like, hey, why don't we also do that? You take those three points and you go down here and then you write like copy or creative upgrade for email campaign Y or a uh, new copy for email campaign Z, something like that. And then you will assign it to a copywriter or a creative at your company that you are paying as a contractor. And so what this means in practice is your organization chart looks like this. You have a founder up top, and you can do this up until like one, maybe even $2 million a year. You have a founder up at top. Underneath the founder are strategists. And then every strategist can handle, let's say 10 clients. So you know that you know if you're at nine clients, you should probably start looking at hiring a strategist pretty soon to take on you know, the overflow. Uh, and then under every strategist, you have all of the contractors they work with. And uh, you know, they, I, ideally, your strategist would work with specific contractors. So like every strategist would have a certain number of directs, right? This is gonna minimize the bloat in your company because uh, you're gonna need, you know, for 10 clients paying, I don't know, $5,000 a month or whatever, you need one strategist, one founder, and then maybe five contractors or something. Like the, the economics of this work really, really well. Anyway, what you do is uh, then obviously it's just like a, a pipeline as the contractors do the work. So, I mean, I'd, I'd make it much more complicated than this, but I didn't want this to be an hour long section. So have your columns, whatever you want. And then uh, what you do is in the resources uh, list or the resources doc, uh, I would like have a bunch of resources. So I'd have like, you know, client Google Drive or something. And you could embed this as a Google Drive right here. And then uh, just have other stuff, maybe like their brand assets or whatever they need. And then every week, what I do is I would automatically generate a new Google Drive folder uh, with whatever the current date is and then the date for one week in advance. And then all that happens is anybody that is a contractor working on a task um, just stores all of the files, the Google Docs, everything that they need inside of that Google Drive. And it, it's known that, hey, it's, you know, it's March the 7th. That means I have to access the March 7th to the March 14th folder. That's like your, your SOP. The benefit to this is your contractors all have guest access with the way that this works, and they can only see the deliverables list. So you have very good data siloing. You don't need to worry about anybody ever taking anything running off on you. Uh, it's extremely easy to manage because as the founder of this business, you basically just manage one or one strategist per 10 clients. Uh, and you, maybe you pay the strategist, I don't know, like 80K a year or something. So you want somebody good. But then, you know, they manage all the contracts. They do everything else. So it, it's insulating. And then it's very scalable. Like if you consider, let's just hypothetically say it's a 5K a month model. So one strategist can have $50,000. Uh, you pay the strategist 80K a year. Uh, what's 80 times or 80 divided by 12? Am I right here, 6,000? Yeah, yeah, so basically you make 50K a month and then you pay, I think 6,000 of that to your, to your strategist. And then maybe your COGS are like 30%, so that's another 15,000. And then you're left with like 29,000, um, not counting for software or other operational expenses. That's damn good, man, you're making a ton of money. Uh, and then because you're doing it through this project management thing, like you just don't need to, you don't need to host the projects anywhere else, you don't need to worry. Everything is in ClickUp and Google Drive, everything's 100% self-managed, so. Yeah, man, that is how I would do it. And I'm extremely excited just showing you guys how that works. It makes me really want to like start my own email marketing agency or something. Anywho, uh, Nick, you mentioned how one of your videos, it's worth it to put at least 10 or 15 hours of your time into learning cold email because cold email is such an invaluable skill today. Where would you go to learn about cold email? TLDR, I would go to Instantly Accelerator, which is app.instantly.ai slash app slash accelerator. You see this once you log in. Don't know if this costs you money. Uh, this may, this used to just be on a bunch of like random Google Docs that the founder Raul just posted all over the internet. So uh, I got my training back when it was free maybe, but all you do is uh, after you sign up for instantly, you go to the bottom left-hand corner, instantly accelerator here, and then just like thumb through every single thing in this course. And this will teach you more about cold email than 99.9% .9 of the world. Um, I say this without a, a, a hint of humility or pride or anything like that. Um, everything that you learn from me I probably at some point just learned from these guys. These guys know everything about cold email and they're very, very up to date with all of that knowledge. So definitely check out the Instantly Accelerator. They're gonna to be top 1% of cold email senders easy, maybe even top 0.1%. Another question, Nick, apart from the LinkedIn scraping method you mentioned in the video, are there any other reliable sources to get high quality data? What is your process for filtering and validating that data as well? This is an awesome question. If you are a business to business agency, um, the two, most common sources and really the ones that just make the most logistic sense are LinkedIn and then to a much lesser extent, Apollo. A lot of people are using Apollo. I'll be honest, I'm pretty sure under the hood Apollo is just using LinkedIn and then they're just selling an arbitrage. Uh, but you know, if you want a more managed service or something, Apollo might be good for you. 
Um, it does have a nice UI and you do get like higher quality data than you do if you try and do it all yourself, which is nice. But uh, basically like what do you pay, 99 per month uh, for 2000 export credits. Uh, export credit is how you would like turn this into a CSV or something. That's a fair amount, man. 2000 a month for $99, that's like, I don't know, 20 cents per person, I think. My math isn't very good. Don't hold me on that. Um, but you can kind of contrast this with the LinkedIn method that I talk about in most of my videos. If you scrape using LinkedIn and Phantom Buster and then use Drop Contact, your monthly cost is probably $350 a month, which is three and a half times this. But then you can scrape probably $1,250 per day. So $1,250 per day times 30 is $37,500. So you're spending 30, for 37,500 leads, you're spending, let's just say 350, which is a cost of, oh, sorry, 300, 350 divided by 37,500 is a cost of like 0 0.0093, contrasted with 100 divided by 2,000, which is 0 0.05. So it's like five times more to use Apollo. I, I don't know. My math just tells me that Apollo, uh, LinkedIn is a better choice for cost purposes, but whatever. Now, if you're not in B2B for whatever reason and somebody is you know, looking for your help or maybe you want to start a business where you're not selling a B2B leads, I would just go to an industry-specific listing website. If I'm doing real estate, maybe it's Redfin. If I'm doing video editing SaaS or something, well, maybe I'm going on like a video editing directory and then I'm scraping all of the people on the video editing directory. Uh, so I'd actually create like an industry-specific scraper. The volume of your leads are gonna be a lot lower, but I also want you to think about it as like the quality of every lead is gonna go up that much more too, because these people, because you have to go through an extra step, these people aren't really getting spammed with emails like most people on LinkedIn are at least like once a day. Uh, so they're gonna respond much differently to, to how your LinkedIn leads would respond. In terms of the filtering and validation step, I'd recommend this process here. Um, if you are getting your leads from LinkedIn or Apollo, you don't really need to do any of this. Uh, well, you don't need to do any of the filtering because the leads are probably high quality enough as is. I wouldn't filter it. Uh, but what I would do is I would enrich the data. And enrichment today means something different than it did like three or four years ago. Back in the day, enrichment meant just like getting the email address of a record. You know, if you have the first name, last name, company name, where they went to school, all that stuff. You could usually pass this into a service like Clearbit and then get a, get an email address of the lead and then, you know, sell them your My Little Pony plushie or whatever. Uh, but these days, um, enrichment means two things. It means that, and then it also means using artificial intelligence to add extra context to the lead and maybe some like additional, additional fields for outreach. So I'm gonna cover the first, which is finding the email address. After this, I'm gonna cover the second. To enrich uh, the email address, I would use either Drop Contact, which is that French company that uh, I probably showed in about in my videos, or I'd use another service called Any Mail Finder. I don't know which pricing is better, but by the time you're watching this video, it may or may not be relevant to you anyway, so I'm not gonna do too much digging. Um, those are just the best services at present. And then what I do is I pass them through, I pay whatever cost per email uh, that I need to there. And then I take the exported records, which you could do automatically or you could just manually do this. And then I create a make scenario. And what the make scenario would do is for every record in this Google Sheet, it would take in like the profile picture, maybe it would take in the LinkedIn summary, maybe it would take in like some additional info. And then I would pass it into AI saying something like, hey, write me a customized first line icebreaker to this prospect using the information that I'm providing below. And the idea behind this would be for you to get something like another column called icebreaker with text that would be, love your shirt, man. Is that UCLA in the background, right? Just something like that. And then what you do is when you pump that into your cold email platform, you use that as the first line uh, or like under, underneath your high name, you use that as like the first real line of your email. So your email would go like, hi, Peter. Dude, is that, uh, love your shirt. Is that UCLA in the background? I wanted to be upfront with you and talk about X, Y, and Z platform because blah, blah, blah. By doing that, you just completely remove yourself from the horde of robotic messages that they're probably getting. And you imply that you know, you're a real human being that's doing this, you're not a robot, uh, which massively improves conversion rates for one, massively improves reply rates for two. And it also just makes it a lot nicer to deal with the prospect. So uh, they're not gonna tell you like, fuck off. They're gonna say, hey man, like, dude, thanks so much for that. Yeah, that is UCLA. I'm not actually looking for business right now, but you know, I appreciate you reaching out. That's somebody that's warm, they're funner to deal with, and maybe you can sell them on something later on. Uh, that's what I would use, even though it's a little bit more expensive. Nick, is there a reason that you choose ClickUp over Airtable for things like CRM building? Absolutely. Uh, ClickUp is like a dedicated, almost like B2B agency project management and CRM tool. And then Airtable is sort of just like a blank canvas that you can paint anything on. So it lacks a lot of the built-in functionality that you get in ClickUp. 
Um, ClickUp has like time tracking built in, assignees, notifications, due dates, all that stuff. And in Airtable, you have to like explicitly add these functions, um, either using Airtable features or going out and getting like plugins or third party time trackers, or that sort of thing. So simply put, since I do CRM builds for B2B agencies mostly or coaching companies, uh, ClickUp just has everything that I need. And so I just use ClickUp. And I have a bunch more logic over here, but yeah, Airtable, Google Sheets on steroids, do whatever the hell you want with it. You're building it from scratch. ClickUp specific to the companies that I work with, I'm gonna use ClickUp. It's also a little bit more cost uh, effective, but I'm not gonna beat a dead horse. Um, and then Airtable also used to have their own built-in automations but because I personally use make.com, I don't really need those. Obviously this may be different for you. And I'd still do use Airtable for some applications, mostly structured data scraping and that sort of thing. Um, sometimes I build out UX stuff, but yeah, most, most of the time I'm using ClickUp these days. Lastly, Nick, when you get a new client, do you have them create their own make.com account and then add you as a user, or do you just like make it for them? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I didn't actually represent that last part then. Uh, do you have the client create their own make.com and ClickUp account first, then add you as a user so you can build it up? That, that's what was asked. So I've experimented with this before, and my personal recommendation, what I personally do, is I will always just give them a call after they sign the deal, and then I will say, hey, over the course of the next few minutes, we're gonna sign up for this platform, that platform, or that platform. Are you already part of any of them? Yes? Okay, great. Then what's your email and password? If there are any issues with that, I explain that the reason why I need the email and password is because I don't wanna to have to go through sub accounts because these usually have some type of information sharing blocker or credential blocker or authority blocker, admin access blocker. Uh, if we're to work together, I wanna to be able to do it efficiently and autonomously without having to ping you every five minutes or deal with two-factor authentication issues. So if you're concerned about the password, you know, could you change it to something neutral and then could we just go from there? Um, you know, and most people don't actually care. They're just happy to give you the email address initially. I'm just pretending that, you know, they have some type of concern. So yeah, I'll just, I'll just do that. And then I'll always have, have their uh, email address and then their password. And then I'll add that into my big fat password manager. I currently use one pass uh, and then I'll just manage that. Okay. That is the AMA guys. Thanks so much for watching that. If you guys found the value in those comments as high as hopefully the scalers community, uh, then please head over there. Uh, Drew Davies is an awesome guy. And I think some of the conversations that we've been having on scalers have also been uh, very high quality here. Um, to do so, I think it's currently free. They're probably going to be paywalling this at some point. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, jump on there if you guys like what you've heard today. Uh, if there's enough demand for it, I can also do an AMA just directly on YouTube, um, answering specifically like my YouTube subscriber questions. I don't mind doing that at all. I really enjoy doing these sorts of things because there's so many questions that I didn't even think were questions that now I'm starting to realize, hey, wait, maybe I can do content on this or maybe I can do content on that. So if anything, it, it helps me just as much as it probably helps you guys. Aside from that, please leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel, comment Nick is awesome for the algo. No, don't, don't actually do that. Um, and then I will catch you on the next video. Cheers.